Thank you very much for having me today. It's a real privilege to be invited to speak along, alongside Nigel Saul and Ian, whose work I have admired for many years. They have taken us on a wonderful tour um, that I'm sure we're all missing of some churches that we haven't seen in COVID times. Being able to pop out and see a church is a privilege lost. So this has been excellent. Um, I'd like to build on some of the work that they have presented to you today. They, they have considered a lot of material artefacts, um, such as paintings and windows and fonts and actual buildings. And these are really wonderful ways to get an insight into the medieval experience. And I'd like to use the paintings just to think about um, not only what do they look like, but what were they actually for? So one of our biggest difficulties when we look at medieval art is as the picture on screen now, we appreciate it as a background picture. Our modern interpretation of art, we're so used to seeing pictures um, that perhaps we don't always remember to look at them as a medieval person might have done. Um, the picture you see on screen, I think it's all of us in our coffee break. Um, but that looks like a person drinking. But what was it actually used for? Um, we tend to take an art appreciation viewpoint and look at things from the basis of style and colour and school of production. And these are incredibly important issues to being able to understand how art became into the church and what that church meant to people in terms of patronage. But is it enough? Do, do we actually then know what it's for? So I'd like to remind us to look at the art in its context. So uh, moving on and moving on. This is the church at Hardham. It's in Sussex. I apologize for the deviation from the March of Territories. But uh, Nigel Saul himself in his 2017 book reminds us that religious art is a religious context. So this is the church and this is what people would have seen as they came to the church. So isolating it and looking as a picture doesn't quite give us the experience that people had. They were in the church for a reason. They were looking at the church for a religious reason and being present there because of those, those religious feelings. So we have to remember that as we look at the art. Many of you will undoubtedly be familiar with the theory of wall paintings as books of the illiterate. Um, and this is a very valuable theory indeed. It reminds us that the medieval people um, were not literate readers in the main. Our laity, some of them had functional literacy. They could read their documents for their land or the tides, but they, they couldn't read as we casually pick up a book and read and the availability of that written material wasn't so much. So pictures became much more important. And let's remember, you wouldn't have had pictures at home. I'm gonna put us all in the medieval peasant class and I apologize to anyone who doesn't feel they would have been a medieval peasant, um, but we wouldn't have had pictures so much at home unless we were noble. So as an ordinary uh, member of the laity coming to church, this decoration would have been quite unique and special to us. Now, the, as a book of the illiterate, does it tell us the story? Yes, yeah, very much so. In many of these paintings, um, we see some of the passion cycles and that reminds us of the story of the passion. But again, is that enough? Is that, is that why people put a painting on the wall? So we dive into what would you have experienced as you stand in front of the painting? And this, these paintings will help us step into a medieval shoes and experience their religion. So I'd like you to come with me, first of all, and we're going to visit Byford Church. We're gonna stand in front of this painting. Uh, this is St. Margaret. Um, question, obviously, how do we know it's St. Margaret? Well, for identifying medieval saints, it is very much all about the attributes. So here we have, Margaret's book and very faintly we have her holding a cross staff. Now this is very much like the staff that you see depicted in pictures of Christ towering hell. It's a long staff, a cross on the end and often she's seen poking it into a dragon's mouth. Um, it's actually a hell mouth where we say dragon 
we mean the mouth of hell. Um, so we know this is Margaret. It's fairly high up. You can see from the angle of the photo. Um, this allowed an altar or statues to be put in front of it. Here, I think it's an altar would have been in front of it. And altars often against the wall rather than pulled forward for someone to stand behind. So you've had your altar against the wall, statues in front of it. This is a little space dedicated to Margaret. And we should always, always think about where is a painting when we see a church? Where am I standing? Am I standing in the nave? Is this a lay position that I as an ordinary person could have stood in? Or am I in the chancel where it might have been a far rarer event for me to be allowed in there? So this is Bar Byford's Margaret. So that, that doesn't tell us a lot about live religion. To, to understand how you would have used Margaret, we need to know a little bit more about her because um, she just seems to be an ordinary that's a nice picture of a saint. Let's all remember to act in a holy way. But again, not enough. So I'm just going to take a quick diversion and we're going to go to Charlwood in Sussex. And this is the life of Margaret. So let's just remind ourselves of Margaret's life story. Now, she shouldn't have a great time, obviously, to end up as a saint. So Margaret was a young Christian virgin who was propositioned by the pagan prophet Elibrius. Um, she rejected his advances and rejected uh, his invitation that she should worship his pagan idols. Unfortunately, didn't take rejection well and threw her in prison where she is subjected to a range of tortures, um, including there's some fairly graphic photos, uh, pictures, sorry, photos, uh, pictures of her being hung by her hair. But the key torture that Margaret is, is famous for is this one. Um, and you'll see here Margaret entering the jail and then being swallowed by a dragon. Um, terribly unfortunate, but Ma Margaret being faithful and uh, resolute in the face of difficulty makes the sign of the cross and bursts free from the dragon. So she is delivered safely. Unfortunately, of course, by this point, her torturers are getting rather fed up with her difficult prisoner and uh, lop her head off at which point her executioner dies as well. So she is clearly sanctified at this point. And as she dies, she asks uh, God for a special favor. She asks that anyone who calls upon her or reads the book of her life will be granted salvation. So now we know the story of Margaret's, uh, Margaret's experiences. How does this help us interpret the painting? Um, back at Byford. So here we see the book again. So we, we're referencing back to the book. So this gives us part of the clue, but knowing her story tells us that we should be looking at, um, at that experience to tell us what people did in front of it. Margaret's key torture was uh, the swallowing by the dragon and she was safely delivered from the belly of the dragon. It made her, as you probably all know, the patron saint of childbirth. Um, so it would have been very common for medieval women to come to the church, kneel in front of this painting and pray before they went in for their delivery. There were a bunch of rituals that you went through as you prepared for childbirth. You would confess your sins on the anticipation there was a pretty high risk of dying and you would pray for safe delivery. So where, we can, where we're standing now in front of this painting we can stand in the shoes of pregnant women who will have prayed for a safe delivery. But is, is that still enough? Are we just looking at pregnant women? Well, no, the book tells us more. So Margaret prayed that anyone who had the book of her life in their house or read it would be delivered um, and achieve salvation. This book here that she's holding is, a, is an image of a book that would have been accessible to a non-literate population. So remembering that most people would not have had a book in their possession, even the nobility owned a very limited set of books. This image gives us a way as a medieval peasant to access that promise of salvation. We can contemplate the book. We can contemplate the life of Margaret and look upon her book and potentially achieve those benefits of salvation. Very specifically, for those of you who have been fathers-to-be at some point, you may have stood in front of this while your wife laboured and remembered that the looking on the book and having the book in your house 
was a specific promise that your child would not be blind, lame, dumb, deaf, or afflicted by an unclean spirit. So all good benefits as parents of teenagers today would say having them not afflicted by an unclean spirit would be a wonderful thing. So the father to be would have stood here, but people generally can achieve this benefit of salvation by standing here or kneeling at this altar, exercising small acts of patronage to the Margaret painting to gain her benefit. Um, so we've talked about very large acts of patronage, so a hundred pounds to build a church. When we think of patronage, we should also think of the very small ones, the penny for, for wax for a candle to go on the altar in front of Margaret. It was often common to leave your rosary beads when you died to your favorite statue or image. And these little acts of patronage are as close as the lower tiers of society can get. And they would have been done often to a painting. It, it's very interesting that we have almost no records of people paying specifically for the paintings themselves, but we have huge amounts of records of people giving wax or a penny or a robe um, or a piece of cloth to images within the church, some of which would probably have been paintings. So in front of this painting, you may have conducted your own small act of patronage, paid for a candle, knelt here and prayed for deliverance. And uh, this, is, this is a wonderful moment in front of this painting where we too can stand in front of it and just experience that tiny slice of life in medieval Byford that day. So moving on, I'd like to take you on for a, another tour, another church, another little slice of medieval life. Let's go to Michael Church ex Eskley. Um, we're in the nave here. We're just entering the nave. To your right is the main door. And to your left, as you come in, you will see uh, a painting um, of a most peculiar theme. Now, this theme has been the subject of much debate over the years. So let's have a closer look at the painting. What we are seeing here with the painting is we have a figure of Christ, mainly naked, wearing a loincloth. Um, I hope you can all see where I'm highlighting. Unfortunately, Herefordshire wall paintings in particular have not survived well. The uh, climate and stone do not favour wall paintings in that part of the country. Um, so, and surrounding Christ, we have lots of images of agricultural implements, tools of work. So we see some shears here. We see a little spinning wheel. We have an axe. Lots of the tools of work. And this um, gave rise to the initial interpretation of this painting. It was felt to be, and you'll find this, if you even Google it, you'll still find paintings listed as this, Christ with the instruments of toil, or Christ of the trades. And it was thought that this painting is Christ blessing the instruments of labor. So far, so good. That sounds pretty nice. Unfortunately, a similar painting was found in Italy and it had a little textual explainer. And that, that radically changed our understanding of what this painting actually means. And it became clear from that, that far from blessing the tools of labor, it's actually warning against using these tools of labor, particularly on holy days. So this painting has now been rechristened, sometimes known as the Sunday Christ, but more often known as the warning to Sabbath breakers. So slightly more menacing interpretation of this painting. We have a warning not to do something. But as so often in, in the paintings, are, are we absolutely sure that what we're looking at is what we think it is? And the devil is always in the detail with wall paintings. Um, this is where you need to get as close as you possibly can and turn every light on when you go to a church to really appreciate the painting. So with a, a warning to the squeamish, I'm going to take you to a close up of a Sabbath breakers at West Chiltington. Here, uh, we can see very clearly from a slightly better survival that we have the tool impaling Christ and the blood dripping from it. And here we have the shears wedged firmly into the leg and the blood dripping. So th there is little doubt about our interpretation 
these tools are definitely inflicting the wounds of the passion again. So going back to Michael Church Eskley, this tells us what tools they were using that might have inflicted these wounds of the passion. So the, the first thing we can get back into medieval life with here is standing in front of these, what tools were busy in using in that village at the time? So we see a whole range of tools here. The mechanics of daily life are shown to us in this painting. And this is fascinating, apart from the religious impact. But when you remember that you're a medieval um, villager and you have just entered your church and you see your own tool of the trade on this wall, impaling Christ, this is a warning to you. And we can imagine the furtive little looks that people may have given this painting as they recall that their plans for the rest of Sunday to maybe catch up on some spinning or do a little bit of work were perhaps not quite what the church wanted um, and perhaps might be a sin. So even as you come through this door, it, it's wonderful to walk in the footsteps of people who may have looked away a little bit and said, oh dear, I, I really do need to do that on Sunday, but I, I guess I shouldn't. And we have to remember what a holy day was in medieval era. It was much more a day. Um, our modern experience of church on a Sunday morning is a little bit different to how medieval people would have experienced their religion as wanted by their bishops. Um, it was hoped for that people would attend mass in the morning, stay for a sermon, which often happened afterwards, ideally do some more prayer at home. And particularly for the gentlemen, you were reminded in a number of instructions that when you eat your dinner, you should be educating your wife and children on the theme of the sermon to make sure they've understood it and providing additional religious instruction during the meal. So the idea of the holy day is much more of a day. So doing these other things, you can see how they wouldn't have been uh, particularly encouraged. Um, and we see a lot of injunctions coming from the church during the medieval period, encouraging people not to undertake activities, particularly football. It um, felt to be particularly rowdy and uncivilized. So they, they would not have been happy in our modern world. But is it enough to say don't work on the Sabbath? So let's have a look at some of the paintings from the March territories. And here I beg your indulgence. Uh, my Welsh pronunciation is non-existent. So uh, please laugh quietly on mute. This is a painting from Langibi Church, and this shows us a number of the tools, tools of labour here. We have a saw and we have a sword, but we also have a glove and more mysteriously as a tool of labour, we have, if you look very carefully and appreciate this, it's very difficult to see, a pair of musical instruments. So they're not necessarily the tools of work. Then again from Langibi, we see a cauldron in the painting. Unfortunately, a monument has been uh, inserted over the top of this painting whilst the painting itself was unknown. And uh, here to the right, we have the painting from Sken Frith, which is also very badly damaged, but you see uh, an ale jug. And particularly here, we have a very elegant jug for wine. Um, so potentially this is not just about labor. Uh, potentially this is doing anything on a Sunday or a holy day. Then what is very interesting about these paintings is their location. So this is the, the red dots mark where the Sunday Christ warning to Sabbath break is painting still exist. And there's not many of them. In, in fairness, this is, this is quite an unpopular theme. It's, it's pretty unique. But you can see we have some clusters on the marcher borders and just over the border, uh, we have a set in the Wiltshire, Gloucestershire border area. So this is interesting. So was there a particular problem with people breaking the Sabbath in this part of the country? Those of you who live there may know better than I, and it may be that people of this area were rather prone to sword fighting, drinking wine, spinning yarn and shearing sheep on a Sunday or potentially the clergy were more fastidious about enforcing these regulations. But the documentary records don't bear this out. When we look at complaints and visitation records, which talk to us about the misdoings of people in the parish, we see as many complaints in these dioceses about breaking of Sundays and people not attending church 
as we do in dioceses like Norwich, where we don't see any of the warning to Sabbath break themes at all. And I think the answer to this is not that we have a particular problem with naughty people um, in this part of the world, but it's about the wider meaning of the painting. Is it just about breaking the Sabbath on Sundays? And I don't think it is. I think it is about a sin that we see replicated in a lot more paintings, and it's the sin of sloth. Now, sloth to modern ears um, sounds like the sin of laziness, but that's not how it was seen in the medieval era. It was the sin particularly associated with spiritual neglect, spiritual laziness. So Thomas Aquinas uh, defined it as a failure to love God with your entire heart. Now that's pretty difficult to depict on a painting. So where we do see it depicted, we see it as missing church. So this is a painting of Sloth um, from Lancarfen, uh, St. Cadoc's church. And here we see our sinner sitting up in bed, failing to get dressed, the devil clearly with his hand on him under the devil's thumb, particularly nice devil, this one. But what is he doing? He is not attending church. We can see the church here and the bell being rung to summon him to church and he isn't there. So this is about spiritual laziness. And it's interesting where this painting comes from. This is a small section of the theme of the seven deadly sins at St. Cadox. This is a commoner painting than is commonly thought. The Seven Deadly Sins is one of the morality genre of paintings, which fits with Sabbath Breakers, Seven Works of Mercy, Seven Deadly Sins, and a very rare theme, The Warning to Swearers, uh, which sees Christ's body dismembered by people swearing. Um, also, The Warning to Gossips, little paintings of two women with their heads together talking in church. But the seven deadly sins is a common theme. It's, it's thought to be rare, but there's actually 56 of them to my current count. And this was the theme of my master's research, which makes it more popular than paintings of St. George. There are more seven deadly sins than St. George's. So we have to wonder why that theme was so popular and how the moralities were used in daily life. So let's just look at what were the seven sins. Um, and what do the paintings look like? So this is Ryslip um, in Middlesex, and this is a painting of the seven deadly sins, which shows us the core components. So here we have a dragon up the middle, and in the dragon up the middle, and we have seven little dragons coming forth. Uh, this, this one at the top isn't showing in, it's in the main dragon's mouth here. And these are the seven deadly sins, little cameos, of people committing the sin. This one is wrath. Um, and then we, we often have this one scratched out. Um, it's the sin of lust. Uh, Victorians were particularly keen on removing the lust paintings in case they incited the choir boys. Um, we have the mouth of hell that our sinners will fall into, again depicted as a dragon, but artistically we'd call it a hell mouth. Up here, the sin of pride. We have death with a spear, spearing pride. Um, so these are the seven sins in cameo. The dragon theme is not particularly common. We see more of the tree theme. This is a painting at Hesset, which has the Sabbath breakers below. You can just see it's very badly preserved, but you can just see at the very bottom, we have some of these tools and there is a small uh, Christ figure in the middle, but above we see the seven sins. So we see a clear association spatially between the seven sins and the Sabbath breakers. So the tree is quite common, particularly in East Anglia. Then we have the woman um, from whom the dragons are bursting forth. And this is a marcher image. This is actually the church at Rawns, but there is a very similar and terribly preserved one that you need to look very closely at, at Alverley in Shropshire. Um, and these are particularly fine paintings. The ones that do survive of the ladies, we see again, death spearing pride. So the lady represents pride. So she only has six dragons bursting from her. Um, and we see the little cameos here again, we see the lust um, and we have little people in the dragon's mouth representing what is going to happen to you if you keep sinning. But this is, this is one of the best and um, obviously because it's one of the best, it has a Mortimer connection. Um, this is Trotton Church in West Sussex. 
And here we are looking at uh, the seven deadly sins around the central male figure. Um, you can see my image from the very first slide. It is not in fact coffee break, it is the sin of gluttony. Um, you see him drinking the wine, it's often depicted as a drinking sin, which is one to remember for all of us thinking about a glass of wine on Saturday night. Um, we see these little devil mouths with our cameos in them. To the right, we see the seven works of mercy. So around a figure of virtue, we have the little labels telling us which for each virtue is. And these are the seven works um, of charity. So visiting the, the prisoner, um, taking care of the sick and burying the dead. He has little labels here, Veniti Benedicti, come to me, you blessed. And over here, um, good photo will show, Itai, benedict, uh, Itai maledicti, go from me, you sinners. These are the words of Christ in judgment. So this is uh, this painting is often known as an abbreviated doom and really is one of the most fantastic surviving paintings. The Mortimer connection, of course, we must touch upon that. Um, Elizabeth uh, Mortimer died in 1471. Uh, she was the daughter of the third Earl of March and wife to first Baron Camoys, Thomas Camoys, and her tomb and his are in the church. And for anyone interested in researching that more, I would direct you to Professor Saul's article on the topic, which is fantastic. Um, so this is our painting and our Mortimer connection. But what does this tell us about how people actually use the painting? So the clue to the morality paintings is in what did you do as a medieval villager? in the church. Well, you heard mass, you didn't often receive the sacrament, but you did hear mass. But the sacrament that you received most often would have been penance. And the sacrament of penance is what we now know as confession. Um, and it has parts of you confess, uh, you perform penance for your sins, acts of restitution, including the seven works of mercy. And uh, then you are absolved of your sins. So this is very much about sin followed by salvation. And uh, what we have already learned today about medieval theology is this is very much at the heart of the medieval experience of lived religion. This is about making sure that at worst you end up in purgatory, not straight to hell. At best, you can clear off your sins and go straight to heaven. But in reality, purgatory is most of our destination and you want to spend as little time there as possible, and you mitigate your time in purgatory by performing penance. So you confess your sins, you show true contrition, um, tears are ideally, true contrition for your sins, and you perform some works of restitution. All very good, this painting reminds you of those, but how does it actually get used? Coming to the church, you might have expected that you would confess your sins in a private manner. I think we are all very familiar with the medieval confessional, uh, with the sorry, with the confessional booth. Um, nice and private, in you go, curtains, doors, um, quiet confession to the priest. But this is unfortunately not the way it was done in the medieval period. Uh, it was very much required to be in the open. And the wording is very interesting, and I wonder if this is the source of the modern phrase, it says it must be at the sight of men, but not at the hearing. So you need to choose a, a place in the church to be seen, but not heard while confessing. And what these paintings have very, very strongly in common is their location in the church. And we talked about location with Margaret. It is even stronger here. The vast majority of Seven Deadly Sins paintings uh, uh, are on the north wall or the west wall in the north corner. Um, they are all at the back down in the west corner, except for those where the layout of the church requires them to be different. And Trotton is a very interesting example. The whole of the Trotton painting scheme is backwards. So the, the uh, seven deadly sins are on the south of the, of the west wall and the seven works of mercy are on the north of the west wall. There's a really good reason for that and Trotton is one of three exceptions. But uniformly, they are in the dark back corners of the church. And let me take you briefly to South Lee in Oxfordshire. This is Seven Deadly Sins, tucked in the back of the north aisle, as far to the back as you can get from the door. So I'm standing, when I took this photo, I'm standing in the main doorway of the church. 
And again, here at Little Horwood, I'm standing in the main doorway. It's a small church and it's as far to the back of the north wall as possible. And I think this tells us where the place of confession was. And the paintings would have provided a very useful aid memoir because there were two attributes to make your confession good enough to buy you some time off purgatory. It had to be complete. You have to have remembered every single sin you've committed. If you forget one, there were many, many stories of the consequences of forgetting even a little sin, that you would not be absolved and you, you would go indeed to hell and have to be rescued by either a miracle or the prayers of your family. So really important to have your confession complete. So you can imagine the utility of working your way around the seven deadly sins paintings, ticking it off. Have I committed lust? No, nope. gluttony? Well, Friday night in the tavern, um, envy? Yep, not so much. You can tick your way around and achieve a complete confession. It also has to be ordered. And these paintings give you that, a nice clear order to talk to the vicar. And it should be remembered that seven works of mercy were also a framework, but it was sins of omission. Have I done uh, good deeds for charity? No, I haven't. Well, that's sin too. So these paintings sitting in the dark northwest corners of these churches give us an indication of where these confessions take place. So to finish, I, I would tell you these, these paintings then allow you to stand in your medieval predecessor's shoes. You can stand or preferably kneel in front of those paintings and find yourself standing in the position that uh, someone five, six hundred years before you did. They knelt and they prayed for either deliverance in childbirth or they reflected on their sins and they worried about hell and they worried about their salvation and they prayed and they hoped. And you can stand there and have that lived religion experience because this is what these paintings were for. They were to help you experience your religion. Thank you for your time. Uh, Paul. Have you received any questions? Yeah, I have. I'm, to be honest, now after that talk, I'm worrying about my own unclean spirit, I must say. <laughs> uh, Tanya, do you have a, have a look in the chat later on, just to some of the love you, you were getting in the chat uh, as, we, as, as we go to the questions. So my first question is from William. He talks about medieval, uh, sorry, you talk about medieval illiteracy, and we know that most people couldn't read, but those who could read like a, like a present child, like reading out loud and not silently, which is a fairly modern skill, and that could be why monks had individual cells to read, so they didn't interfere with others in their community. So obviously wall paintings were very important. Maybe the way, whether you want to comment on that. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting, the idea of medieval illiteracy. As people did have some functional literacy, they could read some words that were familiar. So if we think about when we teach a child to read, we teach them a set of stories. We are probably all familiar with that same core set of stories. If I ask you all to tell the story of Winnie the Pooh, we probably can all do that. We have functional literacy around Winnie the Pooh because we know roughly what those words are saying. And we're able to articulate them because we learn those word forms and the sounds from our parents. We, we couldn't pick up Dickens age six it's that functional literacy for most people who will be familiar with the sounds and the look of the words. They can't read as we would think about it, but they can articulate. They can make the sounds of prayer correctly. They can articulate those words. And I think you're right. Monastic cells very much about private contemplation um, and sounding aloud, but also thinking about what the purpose of reading was. Reading wasn't a quick job then. It, it was about contemplating each word. Um, so a monk would probably be expected to take days to read a page and it's not an incompetence in reading but it's internalizing and meditating on each word because it's again remembering the context of what they're reading it's religious you're supposed to be conducting an act of self-examination worship glorification by the act of reading so it's it's really interesting when you touch on these things as medieval to remember how people thought about looking at pictures and reading words very differently to us. Um, it's a much more, I think it's the slow movement we have in our, our modern world so where we should slow down and think about things far more deeply. Um, quality versus quantity was very much the medieval approach here. 
you know, I'm all and about it's the noticeable. Quality of the quality. Sorry. I'm... Sorry, I should say, in some of the paintings are words. You will have noticed in some of the ones that I put up, there are pieces of text and they would have been familiar what those texts said. Uh, in the Trotton painting, I'm sure the entire congregation knew Venetae Benedictae. That, those are the words used to call the congregation at Easter. They will have been familiar with those words. They knew that the things on the right were the things you definitely should do because Venetae Benedictae, if you've done those. Okay, great. So I've got another question from Helen. It's slightly left field, this one. Uh, yeah. So thinking of the recreation of wall paintings at the Church of St. Tylo, formerly at Clandilo of Talabont, um, and the Museum of St. Fagans, can we make an authentic recreation of a church wall painting? And can we ever recreate the medieval experience? Oh, I, I would love to say yes. I would really love to. I, I have dreams of doing it with a projector on churches that have lost their paintings to Victorian restorations. I think we can, but we need to work very hard on thinking about experiencing as medieval people. Um, some of those recreations are fantastic in reminding us that churches were dual colour. They were brilliant, bright, um, as we saw at Pembridge in Nigel's talk, decorated throughout. They weren't just images. The, the bits that were plain had masonry patterns, rose patterns. So I think they give us a really great reminder that we can experience a church, but it is moving ourselves into that medieval mindset. Um, and it would be lovely to have an experience of contemplation at one of these recreated churches where we could go in and experience the mass or the confession as they did. Yeah, I think, have you seen John Jenkins or the, the Centre for um, Christianity and Culture at York? They've done the, the, the Shrine of St Thomas Becket at Canterbury. I think mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that, is becoming more available and the idea you know that you can kind of recreate that partially at least the experience visual experience at least yes and is it partly there's some work going on with music in particular mm. and recreating how music um and scent with the incense um will have affected that experience so you do need to make it a rounded experience so not just go in but you you will need that smell of incense you'll need the waft of incense obscuring the statues occasionally because this is a smoky atmosphere um, you need to leave the lights off as well so we need to take out some of the modern recreations I mean it's difficult in some churches where windows have been changed um, in particular and enlarged though those who have clerestories that are much later but there will be some that we could do this very valuably with and I'd urge a visit to Trotton of anyone who's interested in doing so definitely going to go now um, one Jane, sorry, Paul. Um, Jane has commented that uh, St Albans Cathedral recreates one of their images during a guided tour, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, and also, um, a couple of people have uh, commented, Tanya, with how much they've enjoyed your talk, uh, but have, have asked a question. Which is when is the when is the book? <laughs> uh, the book is stuck behind the submission of my uh, doctoral thesis because I believe my supervisor will will read me the riot act if I don't finish that one first. Um, and regretfully, I am part time student. I have a full time job in the corporate world, so the defil's got a few years to run. But maybe three Christmases time. Have a look on your Amazon list. Very <laughs> Paul. Uh, no, there's one question just come in from Bronwyn. Uh, did wall paintings in churches reflect the views of local politics? So, for example, things like beginning of Lollardy, did those did they cause paintings to be redone or to be vandalised in some way? Or oh yes, fabulous question. Actually, fabulous question. Um, the image I showed you last of Little Hallwood um, is a nice one where you can actually see the layers of painting where they've changed their mind about what goes where. So St Nicholas was painted over by the seven deadly sins. So potentially St Nicholas had not done his job for that church. It's interesting it is the dedication, but there is now no painting of St Nicholas in that church because it has been entirely obscured by the seven deadly sins. But there's also one um, up in Bury St Edmunds uh, that shows a real moment in time where the local politics changed. During uh, the Black Death, they overpainted um, one of their saintly images and it was St. Ed Edmund 
was overpainted, and I think it was by Nicholas, but I'd, I'd need to double check, because he had failed to protect them from plague, and the Abbey was pressing them for the payment of tithes whilst they were all suffering from plague. And in the political dispute between this village, clearly the first thing to go was the painting of mm. St Edmund, not only failing to protect them, but the Abbey failing to um, do its job as a good lord. Mm. So yes, you do see these wonderful painting changes and we, it would be amazing if we ever found minutes, and I'm sure they don't exist, of that PCC meeting. I'm sure most of us have sat in the parochial council meetings and debated details for half an hour. What did it take to debate the replacement of your wall painting? Fabulous political moment in a village that I think is probably very lost to us. Mm -hmm.